You're watching Telecom TV from SDN NFE World Congress in The Hague. And joining us now is Jim St. Ledger, who is Director of Open Source Strategist at Intel. Jim, thanks for joining us again on Telecom TV. Thanks, Guy, great to be here. How, you're heavily involved in, in the open source community, open source world. Um, what sort of, the, what sort of um, activities are you, are you currently um, involved with? Yeah, so these days my job is sort of a horizontal job across open source, and I look across the vast majority of networking projects, try to find out, hey, what are the things that are new and emerging? Uh, what are places we think we need to get involved? What are places perhaps we need to create? Um, some of the hottest areas today that I spend a fair bit of time are on the edge. So I'm involved in Linux Foundation Edge, or LF Edge project. Uh, in fact, in that I'm the Intel rep and the Technical Advisory Council, and I chair the Technical Advisory Council for LF Edge overall. And that's kind of an emerging um, activity today. We've got two anchor projects in there, Acrano and EdgeX. Acrano being kind of an integration project that's serving the needs of, of both telecom and networking as well as enterprise um, and other areas. And then EdgeX Foundry, which is looking at IoT and bringing some applications in there. Then there's a few other projects in there as well. Project Eve, which is looking at edge virtualization. Um, Fledge, which is a project uh, formerly known as Foglamp that just moved in recently. Look at mission critical IoT type applications. Um, Open Edge is now a project called um, Vital, or Beetle rather, sorry, that came in from Baidu. They brought it in, looking at some uh, Open Edge applications there. Um, and Glossary, that's another project, sort of, uh, if you're familiar with CNCF's roadmap, trying to put those kind of things together. So, lots of interesting uh, elements happening around the edge. I spend a chunk of my time on that right now. Edge is obviously a very, very important area and, and focus at the moment, but what, what are some of the trends you're seeing within the, the various open source communities? Yeah, so a lot of what's happening today, there, there's a little bit of a, um, let's call it a uh, expansion of open source projects, right? Um, I think there's been a recognition of the value of open source from a standpoint of the industry finding problems, converging resources and technologists and engineers and developers on them, and then trying to get together to quickly solve them. So those are happening. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work in networking, of course, since NFE launched in you know, the Etsy paper in 2012. Uh, OPNFE kicked off and then Linux Foundation Networking grew, uh, plus other dimensions like OpenStack and others that complement into it as well. Uh, that work continues to this date. Um, if you've been following the GSMA and OPNFE folks coming together to do uh, CNTT, the Common NFE I Telco Task Force, that's really interesting. Trying to say, hey, we need to get these VNFs figured out and make NFE actually really work and a little easier to deploy. That's, that's interesting because it's been a very, so. very fast progress, hasn't it? And, it's it, been and tremendous also progress, directed yeah. by the, the operators themselves. That's right, that's right. And I think this merger between GSMA coming in with all the operators saying, we have these problems. How can you help us fix these problems? OPNFE guys and Linux Foundation Networking guys coming in and saying, hey, we've been working on this. We started doing OVP, the OPNFE validation program. If we do another layer on that and merge with you guys, we can really bring a solution together that should be fantastic. Um, they've made great progress for anyone who's interested more. If they take a look at the wiki site on there, um, I took a look before coming here just to sort of get up to speed on it and I'm amazed at the amount of work they have between models, reference architectures, and other implementation plans. So it's really interesting. The other, um trend we're hearing about here, um, I said in the past few months really, it's starting to, to, to emerge very, very prominently, is, is cloud native technologies. Right. Um, what, why, why the apparent sudden interest from the CSP community in what cloud native can do? Yeah, so you say sudden interest, um, I'd strongly argue it's not sudden interest, but it's been building and building and building and building, and it's now becoming much more visible. Um, you know, the promise of cloud native technologies, it, it's, it's a compelling value proposition, right? Um, as our container implementations as well, and then Kubernetes as an orchestration element or things. Um, even the OpenStack folks are now supporting both VMs and containers, right? So you've got a bunch of things coming together in here. Uh, when you look at efficiencies from it, there's a promise when people look at the cloud service providers and say, hey, those guys have been making this cloud native model work. In the telco space from a network operator, we're moving to telco cloud implementations. We had to be able to use some of this. We have different challenges, right? We have service level agreements that are very different from your large global cloud service providers. If they go down for a little bit, you know, it takes a little bit longer. It's not the same as to when your video conference link drops or something else, right? So the promise of cloud native though is to help make your network more efficient, make it more nimble, make it more scalable and that there's a lot of work happening in that space. It's another exciting space, and I think there'll be more to come in a few years. From the 
telecom's perspective, there does seem to be a, a lot more focus on open source and the, and the, the work of the various open source communities and, and the projects. How are things different in, in open source now to five, five, ten years ago? Yeah, so first and foremost, I'd say the number of people that are involved, right? If you went back 20 years ago and looked around open source, people would probably give one answer, Linux, right? And, and Linux is probably maybe the flag bearer for open source, right? Linus Torvald started it back in the multivariant Unix days, right? You had all these my own flavor of Unix that were all incompatible. Um, those days are long gone, right? Uh, so then Linux sort of set the stage as to how a community could come together, built some of the tools like Git to enable them, and now you see those tools implemented through GitLab and GitHub and other places to make it much easier to bring these projects together. There's lots of companies out there like Atlassian and others that have these tool chains that open source communities regularly use, and there's portfolios of options. So what you see now is when people have great ideas, but they know, hey, I can't just execute this idea myself, I need some like-minded people to help me and help maybe from a standpoint of giving inputs, giving requirements, or putting resources in to do it. And you see an awful lot of that. Um, it's an exciting space. In the SD-WAN space, you know, there have been a few efforts to try to get some open source work started. Then there's a startup called FlexiWAN that says, hey, we think we can do an open source model of an SD-WAN solution. And that's very interesting as well, right? So there's people that want a hardened commercial solution, don't care if it's open or not. There's other people that want to roll your own open source solution. And then there's a spectrum in the middle and an open source helps expand that spectrum to provide more solutions to the marketplace, and that's always good. You've already referenced a number of open source projects, uh, and we see, we see the maps of these communities, right. and they're vast. There's hundreds of projects, many of which are applicable to telecoms, hundreds are probably applicable to telecoms. What, what actually starts the incubation of these projects? What, what, what drives their creation? Yes, so a lot of times it's a couple of things. So first, it's almost always a problem, right? There's some problem in the industry, someone needs to solve it. Um, how it gets solved in the origin story of that, it could be a, a variety of things. One could be, hey, there's a company that's worked on a solution themselves. Uh, in many cases, that solution is an in-house or proprietary solution, and they say, hey, you know what? We want to bring this solution to the broader world and make it available for others. We think the broader impact and the ability to sort of, you know, rising tide raising all boats in the industry can help out, and someone will contribute that seed code to launch and start a project. So that's one, one way, sort of a, a greenfield launch, I'll call it. The other one is where a collection of people that share the same kind of problem statement, they look at it and say, hey, we all need to share the same problem, solve the same problem. In many cases, those people People could be competitors in a business terms, but from an industry perspective, they have this problem they all need to get through. And they will get together and say, hey, here's the problem, let's brainstorm on solutions, then let's get together in a community and solve them and do that. And, and you see more and more of that, it's sort of like collaborative competition to some degree. Is the process involved in these open source projects? Is it, is it all working correctly? Is it, is it a well-oiled machine or, or are there certain aspects that probably need to, need, need to change? Yeah, well-oiled machine is interesting. Um, if you've been involved in any human-to-human uh, -human relationship when you get more than two people or even two people, there's less a thing as a well-oiled machine. Um, there's always tension. But it's very healthy tension. Um, you know, the, the word open source, the open is really what it's all about. It's these communities coming together. Um, in fact, in Antwerp at Open Networking Summit, there were several communities that came together for face-to-face -to -face meetings. And they bring all the people in and you have some very heated, passionate discussions and debates. But at the end of the day, everybody leaves largely on the same page, saying, hey, that was a healthy conversation. I won some, I lost some, but I agree with where we're going. Um, I don't know if that equals a well-oiled machine, but at the end of the day, that kind of dialogue and debate leads to better results. What about the, the, the financial model, the funding model, the licensing model of, of, of open source? Be, because there's, there's still quite a few skeptics out there who don't probably understand how it all works or, 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 or why they should invest time and effort into something that others can, can take and use. Right, right. Um, the interesting thing, if, if, I'll take a moment just to go all the way back to what I'll call the early, early Linux days when some operating system software models were coming out and everyone said, oh, it's free software. Um, if you've been around any industry long enough, you understand there's no such thing as free. The question is how you pay for it, right? Free software, if you're using it and implementing it yourself, is paid for by your resources to aggregate, integrate, test, and maintain that software. There's a lot of people that say, that's way too much work, I'm going to go buy it from a vendor. Now that vendor will take that free software and build a product, but he's selling you that work he's done on it and the service and support. That's got a lot of value right there in itself. The value in most communities today is really the sharing of R&D costs on doing something to accomplish a big objective. A lot of smaller companies could never afford to do that on, the, on their own. 
So the investment in companies and the justification is always, do you have this problem? Do you need to overcome this problem? If you can't afford the 10 resources to do it, but you can afford the two, go find five other people to work with you and you can get them to put some resources in and get the problem done. So there's really an R&D efficiency of open source models. So for those companies that are still on the fence or about to consider investing time and resources in open source, what should they consider? What's your recommendation? Yeah, so the first thing is I think you have to have a serious look at it. And what I mean by serious look is you need to tag a few people to say at least half or all of your job for a certain window of time is go look at these projects and go figure out, all right, what are the things you're trying to fix and what do these projects offer? The next thing is get those people involved in the projects. And being involved can start out with just join some of the community meetings, read some of the forums, subscribe to the developer list, participate in the conversations. The single best thing I encourage all of them to do in the beginning is show up when the community has a face-to-face -face meeting. Very often these face-to-face -face meetings are at things like Open Networking Summit, at KubeCon, at Open Source Summit, at Embedded LinuxCon, et cetera. There's lots of these events around the world. There's other community events like FOSDEM in Brussels. When the communities show up there, you as a new person can come in, have conversations with the veterans, ask a lot of questions and learn a lot. And then you can understand, okay, how should I participate in this community now if I decide it's the right one? Um, as someone who's in these projects myself, my recommendation to ask always is, hey, put some resources in, put your skin in the game, so to speak. Um, there are a lot of people, however, who just look at it and say, hey, you're producing what I want, I'm just going to consume. And that's okay, there, there's no rules of open source that say you can't. The licenses, by definition, are what are called permissive licenses. They let you take it and do what you want with it for the most part. Um, but we do ask people, hey, it really would be nice if you could contribute back, because that's how the communities run. They don't run because one person decides they should do it by themselves. They run because each company puts an incremental set of resources in to help get the job done. We started our conversation uh, looking at a number of the edge projects you, you're involved with. How, how, how can open source really help operators with their edge deployments and, and, and services? I, I think first and foremost is trying to figure out, okay, what are, so first of all, what type of edges are you working on, right? So as you saw in some of the presentations here this week, there's lots of definitions of the edge. There's from the IoT device side, there's from the access side, whether it's MEC or, or RAN related, virtual RAN, et cetera. There is central office edge. We have some work called Next Generation Central Office. And, there's, and then there's, of course, moving up to the cloud, et cetera. So there's a spectrum of the edge projects. Each one of those has different needs. So then you have different projects like EdgeX working on the IoT device side and making sure we have connectors for pretty much any edge device, any edge sensor, et cetera, wired, wireline, et cetera, wireless. There's lots of things happening there. When you move to the next level and you're trying to do the network edge, whether that's enterprise edge or telco edge or RAN edge, there's a lot of requirements there from a mech perspective and others as well. And that's where projects like Acrano can go and tackle those kind of problems and bring solutions in place. So there's lots of solutions across the open source industry that can do that. Uh, there's others, you know, there's um, edge work happening in CNCF, there's edge work happening in OpenStack Foundation. So there's a myriad of projects that are trying to bring solutions in to help meet this edge, edge needs. And I think there's a lot of those things that are going to get adopted and explored over the coming years here. Jim, very insightful, and thanks again for joining us on Telecom TV. Thank Great. you. Really much appreciated. Thanks. thanks.